So there's a lot not to feel so good about. The question is, how can we change it? And for one thing, Dr. King's own words suggest that we need to start by recognizing where our battle plans have fallen short. On May 8, 1967, a year almost to the day before he died, and four years after the famed I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington, Dr. King gave an interview to NBC News' Sander Van Oker, telling him that his dream had turned into a nightmare, decimated by the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism. King told Van Oker, now I'm not one to lose hope, I keep on hoping, I still have faith in the future, but I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say that over the last, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments, and I've come to see that we have many more difficulties ahead, and some of the old optimism was a little superficial, and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go, and we're involved in a war on Asian soil, which, if not checked and stopped, can poison the very soul of our nation. And here comes the important part. He says, I think the biggest problem now is that we got our gains over the last 12 years at bargain rates, so to speak. It didn't cost the nation anything. In fact, it helped the economic side of the nation to integrate lunch counters and public accommodations. It didn't cost the nation anything to get the right to vote established. Now we're confronting issues that cannot be solved without costing the nation billions of dollars. Now I think this is where we're getting our greatest resistance. They may put it on many other things, but we can't get rid of slums and poverty without it costing the nation something. We face a situation where the gains we have made have been largely cost free, or at least they've seemed that way. Dr. King was a dreamer, but he was also a realist. And the truth is, we pretty much got a first black president in 2008, largely cost-free, without really having to deeply examine our racial legacy. Yes, when he was belittled in vile racial terms during the 2008 campaign and called to account for the words of his pastor, then candidate Barack Obama gave a masterful treatise on race. But his campaign largely rested on noting the racially divisive views of loved ones and then loving them anyway, not on challenging them to think differently. The disappointment that drove Obama's numbers down with white Americans came every time he actually tried to do the opposite, when he tried to use the authoritative voice of the presidency to challenge racism where he found it, whether in the arrest of his friend Skip Gates in Professor Gates' own home, or in his empathy for Trayvon Martin, or his eulogy for slain police officers in Dallas. When, Obama, when President Obama was praised, it was for the times when he eschewed calls for racial self-examination in favor of calls for black America to rise above its pain. His calls for amazing grace, as his beautiful eulogy for the Charleston Nine is remembered for. Now, I had a pastor friend of mine uh, say to me after the massacre at Mother Emanuel uh, and the funeral in which President Obama so moved the country through those snippets of singing Amazing Grace, that black Americans are the only people on earth expected to react to every whip and slight with amazing grace. Murder us in church, amazing grace. Shoot our children for playing with a toy gun, amazing grace. Choke out our fathers on the street so they can't breathe because they were maybe selling loose cigarettes, amazing grace. Barack Obama had to take the birther taunts, the questions about his grades, whether he wrote his own uh, thesis, questions about his faith, attacks on his children, his wife, with amazing grace. And had he not, he never would have been president. 